today signifies the realization of a lifelong aspiration. See what we've woke up to here. This is actually opening morning of my very first ever doll sheep hunt. We've been working our way up this mountain since yesterday. This is awesome though. Dustin staring at me like, let's go. <laughs> We were supposed to be here in 2020 originally, and then the pandemic hit, and we weren't able to get into Canada. So our hunt was canceled in 2020, again in 2021, and uh, here we are. It's something I've dreamed of my whole life, and then just the last five years been waiting for to happen. It's so high up there, and it's not easy to do. It's not cheap to do. So it was a big, big reach for me to kind of make the commitment to be here. For months, I have prepared myself both physically and mentally, examining every piece of equipment and researching the terrain. The Northwest Territories can be brutally unforgiving. It requires meticulous planning and peak physical condition. And yet, despite our best efforts and well-laid plans, life typically finds a way to shatter these illusions of control. I just found out that my Aunt Sue passed away last night, so... You know, it's, uh, I couldn't be in a much more beautiful spot to remember her. You know, I love what I do and I wouldn't trade it, but I, these are, you know, sometimes you gotta be out here when you would rather maybe just be home for that day with your family. But I know there's nothing I can do and she's in a better place, but. <sighs> just, yeah, sometimes it's hard. As it always is for those left behind, we have little choice but to press on. It's through these unexpected deviations that we uncover our true strength. Amidst the chaos, we find the opportunity to redefine ourselves, to grow, to evolve. There's a lone sheep there. I haven't traveled this far, invested so much time and effort, and endured these hardships for just any ram. My objective for the next 10 days, while undeniably challenging, is crystal clear. I am here to claim North America's most prestigious big game trophy. I'm here to harvest the oldest, and largest ram in these mountains. We're just kind of moving a little bit slower this morning, drinking some coffee, collecting our thoughts, trying to figure out what the plan is. So. Dustin spotted seven rams on this face here this morning that we're on. Pretty great spot to wake up and drink a cup of coffee though. I should clarify that this expedition is not a meat hunt. Although wild sheep are highly nutritious and I fully intend to make use of every part of the animal, if my primary aim were solely to obtain protein, 
there are much more economical alternatives. Pound for pound, the cost of dull sheep meat harvested from the expansive Canadian wilderness can rival that of Japan's esteemed Kobe beef. So right now, we're watching a ram across the basin here that from this distance looks like a ram that definitely needs a closer look. But I mean, you couldn't ask for more than this. Day one here, and we've already got a ram that looks like it's worth a closer look, so. Wild game meat is a strong motivation for the vast majority of hunters, has been since the beginning of time and, and continues to this day. But there are situations like sheep hunting where the meat is a bonus. It's not the point of the adventure. We're in a really good spot here. We're gonna kill this ram, I'm guessing, in the next 48 hours at the most. I'm guessing the next eight. Just now thawing out from spending the night on the mountain. No tent, no sleeping bags. We're out of food now. But the ram is like slowly coming towards us. And we've just, we're at this point of commitment that we can't back out now or we could lose our one opportunity when he crosses through here. So we're just like trying to stay warm, trying to keep our mind in it. You know, don't get me wrong, sheep meat is some of the most fantastic wild game meat we have. Uh, but there is, there is something more to sheep hunting than acquiring meat. And it's, it, it's the whole package. It's, it's the adventure, it's the challenge, it's the backcountry back experience, it's, it's testing your will and your nerve and your stamina. This ram is just moving extremely slow, but we feel so confident in our location that we're really hesitant to move as long as he keeps kind of inching this way. It's, it's all the training and preparation that you go through to you know, be able to put yourself in a position to be successful that all come into this package. And, and therefore, yeah, it's easy to say that, well, this is a trophy species. Uh, if you wanted to hang a label on it. Must have winded us. That'll humble a guy real quick. In the lexicon of hunting, the term trophy has undergone an evolution. The American Museum of Natural History features a remarkable exhibit of wild animal specimens mounted in settings of their native habitat. The concept of a trophy first emerged through the lens of our innate appreciation for the grandest and oldest ambassadors of the wilderness a testament to the challenges faced and the reverence held for these remarkable creatures. Yet misconceptions and misrepresentations have cast a shadow over this terminology, transforming it into a weapon aimed at the heart of all hunting endeavors. I've been using the, the term trophy uh, for years to um, identify a exceptional uh, species. You know. That term has been uh, co-opted, kidnapped, and, and corrupted, in my opinion, to be a derogatory term, um, to state that your motives may not be as pure as we know they are. Honestly, I'm more concerned about the reasons why we're at a place in time where we're feeling the need to 
define trophy hunting rather than actually defining trophy hunting, which is difficult. Uh, what was a trophy to me when I was 15 years old compared to today is, is vastly different. But like I said, my, my bigger concern is, you know, why, why is this a topic of conversation now? Um, we're certainly in a place in time where uh, there's an organized effort, uh, anti-hunting, animal rights groups have latched on, they've weaponized the, the term trophy to pry away public support for all hunting. The term trophy is deeply rooted in the history of hunting in North America and carries significant cultural and historical connotations. It symbolizes more than just a physical representation of a hunted animal. It embodies the traditions, values, and aspirations of hunters throughout the ages. In the early days of North America's exploration and settlement, hunting was crucial for survival and livelihood. Indigenous communities and early European settlers hunted animals for food, clothing, and tools. Valuable specimens were kept as trophies, symbolizing the hunter's skill and success. As society evolved, hunting became more recreational. The concept of the trophy expanded beyond practical uses and became associated with exploration and adventure. Figures like Theodore Roosevelt, an avid hunter and conservationist, popularized trophy hunting not only as a pursuit of adventure, but as a method for preserving wildlife for future generations. So back in the eight, late 1800s, um, you know, our game populations overall were, were in dramatic decline, and they were they were bottoming out. Most of it had to do with market hunting. Back in those days, market hunting, you could shoot uh, meat for sale, you could shoot meat for hides, um, and you know the fur business was alive and well. And so that uh, that was the way a lot of those. Uh, early pioneers made a living. They just took too much. Roosevelt at the time, uh, in 1883, he owned two ranches uh, in western North Dakota by Medora. And as he rode around on uh, the plains of Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, and the Dakotas, as he saw the decimation of our wildlife species, and he saw um, the wanton waste of our natural resources and so in 1887 he decided um, you know to go back home and he wanted to call together a group of people to try to solve the problem at hand and that was when the Boone and Crockett Club was formed and they tried to figure out ways to bring these species back. They started putting together massive land in the in the public trust you know the national Forest Reserves, which became the U.S. Forest Service and the National Park System and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. They eliminated market hunting. They established laws. They put management in the hands of the states. And so eventually that, that trend did turn around and start moving in the right direction. Boone and Crockett is almost synonymous with the term trophy. For almost a hundred years, they've kept records of the largest specimens of North American big game. While many hunters consider it an honor to be listed in these historic pages, it was never designed to be a point of prestige. When all this conservation, the emphasis on conservation happened in the late 1800s, early 1900s, you know, there was suddenly the need for some way to measure the success of that effort. You know, the science at the time was that a mature male specimen uh, that was harvested in an ecosystem was an indicator of the health of that ecosystem. Uh, we started our awards program, um, you know, encouraging people to enter their trophies so that we could keep track of uh, what was harvested where. And so, you know, these wildlife biologists and managers share this information so that they can figure out, you know, what issues they're having and how to fix those issues. and to increase the health of their, of their populations and their ecosystem. You know, you can't record every animal taken, but if you take a snapshot of the top end, 
it won't tell you what the problem is, but you can see trends. This area used to put out this many 180 inch deer. Now we only see one every 20 years. What's different there? So it's, a, it's an indicator that you can use to see areas that are improving or you know dropping off. So the, you know, the records program was a science-based measurement tool from the beginning. Hunting was obviously an effective management tool. And so um, tying those two components together, creating this database, uh, was a, allowed us to implement conservation measures to uh, preserve species. First and foremost, you know, we're, we're a conservation organization. You know, having wildlife on the landscape and protecting that wildlife and its habitats. Um, you know, everybody knows this is the is the big game records folks, but you know, first and foremost, I mean, we could we could quit keeping records tomorrow, and Boone and Crockett would continue on as a conservation organization. That is. That is our purpose, is, is making sure that stuff's there for future generations. You know, yes, we, we do have world records and it, people get a kick out of it, you know, but at the end of the day, I always tell everybody, you know, I'm more excited about a, an entry from a county that I've ever seen, that I've never seen in before, than I am a new world record that comes across, you know, because that new county is saying this area now has the ability to get these animals to this age class, the habitat's healthy and the animals are healthy. Not only have trophies played a large role in shaping many of the policies we enjoy today, the National Collection of Heads and Horns, held at the Bronx Zoo, had a significant impact on the public's perception of wildlife in the 1900s. The National Collection, established by the Boone and Crockett Club in 1902, showcased an extensive variety of big game trophies from North America and around the world. As visitors entered the display, they were met with an unusual dedication. So that placard, the Vanishing Big Game Animals of the World, that was intentionally put up to um, ignite the American public. And the American public in particular just didn't take well to the fact that they were, that these species were disappearing. New York City, largest population center in the United States and hung this sign over there and it was there to piss people off. People came from all over the world to marvel at these fascinating creatures that they'd never seen before. And, and they read that sign, they, they got pissed. They go, what, what do you mean vanishing? You know, how, how could this be happening? How could we let this happen? And, and so that sign was intentional because they knew that once the American public figured out that these animals were their animals, they belonged to the public trust, and that those animals were disappearing, uh, they believed, and they ended up being right, that uh, people would get really upset about it, put a lot of pressure on you know, state and federal legislatures and members of Congress and, you know, in order to be able to pass these laws that help fix the problem. Conservation wasn't a word in the English language. Most people were oblivious to this. Sportsmen were the eyes and ears. They were the boots on the ground. They're the ones who, that witnessed this decline firsthand. The broader public was not engaged in conservation at that point. This collection at the Bronx Zoo was, was kind of the tipping point. People started to pay attention. We're human animals. We're fascinated by other animals. And it's been that way since the, you know, the dawn of man. So that display got people way more interested in what was going on, especially when it came to wildlife. And we talk about trophy. Trophy is very closely tied to the birth of the conservation movement and the success of it, because these were trophies that people were looking at. In a sense, these preserved trophies act as ambassadors, bridging the gap between humanity and the natural world and inspiring a greater understanding and reverence for the intricate web of life that surrounds all of us.
I've been training for this hunt for about the last six months, but even being prepared and spending a lifetime in the mountains, I will say I wasn't quite ready for this hunt. I knew it was going to be tough, but it was even tougher than that. The thing that I've learned is sheep hunting is a lot more mental than physical. You can either be in the best shape or the worst shape, but it's all upstairs if you keep going. It's hard. It's, uh, it's not for everybody sleeping on rocks. I know guys that are football players or big jocks that you know, run marathons. Two days sleeping on rocks, eating freeze-dried, running out of water, going several days without a change of underwear. People say, get me out of here. You know, I've had enough of this. It's, it's so sheep hunting, especially backpack hunting, is a different ballgame. But uh, on the other hand, it's so rewarding. I think anybody who's stubborn enough can be a sheep hunter. I tell everybody coming when they, you know, they're like, oh, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not in that great a shape, or, oh, I'm 60 years old, or they have an age on it that they're like, oh, I probably need to go in the next couple years. And I truly, truly believe that as long as you never quit, you can be a sheep hunter. It's having the heart, having the heart in it, and it might take you all day to get up that mountain. It might take you two days to get up that mountain, but as long as you never stop, you never quit on it, you have the opportunity to be a sheep hunter. As far as a lot of my clients are more about the experience and the adventure, um, you know, we try to give them a trip that they'll remember, push them a little bit past their limit of what they thought they could do and help them grow that way. You know, we could do things a lot easier sometimes, but um, we try to put them in a position to sheep hunt, not kill sheep. Just a young ram, full curl ram, two yards. Done, I mean, directly below me. Full curl, but what do you think, like four? I think he's probably like maybe five or six. Yeah. Just a young one, not one we're after. That was incredible though. That, uh, that, was, that was super cool. Language is a fluid and ever-changing entity, constantly shaped by cultural shifts and evolving perspectives. The issue with the term trophy hunting lies in its separation from the broader concept of selective hunting. Originally, trophy hunting was recognized as a legitimate conservation tool, but over time, it has gradually acquired a negative connotation. You know, removing a mature male animal has been a part of our conservation movement, early wildlife management philosophy that remains to this day, as opposed to shifting harvest pressure onto the breeding population. That would be catastrophic. That's not sound science. That's not sound wildlife management. In fact, when when we were having some success in recovering big game species and, and legalized hunting was coming back, it was only males. Uh, females were off the table. Uh, so that's why we had buck tags and bull tags and sportsmen of that 
time and embrace that. They felt like they were doing something to perpetuate the species by selectively only shooting males. And if you have an opportunity in mature male, that would be the one to take. The idea of a selective harvest, there's nothing wrong with that at, at all. And those of us that, that talk trophy, that's what we think of as selective harvest. I think there's a lot of, of translation, like lost in translation that comes with trophy. But if you told somebody that was against trophy hunting what we were doing, I don't think they'd have a problem with it. A trophy hunter is a selective hunter. A selective hunter is one that goes out specifically looking for the biggest animals he can find. And though, and we encourage that because it's, it, uh, it helps the health of those wildlife populations to take those, um, those older animals out and let the younger animals come up and mature and, and do the breeding. It, and it, so it maintains the health of the population by removing those older animals, um, for lack of a better term, that have served their purpose. Good eyes on them. Yeah, they're down in the timber down here. It's important to me to take the older rams because of their breeding ages. Your prime rutting ages when they're at their prime is like seven and eight years old. That's when they're gonna do the most breeding. Say the 12 year old might not be breeding anymore. So it's better to take those ones. And uh, you know, 12 year olds, they might not last the winter, right? I've had hunters out and there's an eight-year-old and a 12-year-old standing beside each other and the eight-year-old is way bigger and it's like, they want to shoot the eight-year-old and I, I'm like, I'm not even going to take you up the mountain if you're going to shoot the eight-year-old because you're basically killing two rams by doing that. Our job is, you know, of course, to get the client an animal, but we want to continue to do this for years and years, so to hunt the old oldest ram on the mountain is pretty important because we know it's best for the sheep. Third year is here. Fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. We're basically seven year old ram. It's not quite uh, the age that we want to shoot. Decided it's not the ram we came here for. The cool thing about sheep is they show their age right on their horns like, you know, a big elk. An elk or a deer can grow a giant set of antlers at three and a half, four and a half years old. And unless you really study their body, it's hard to tell if that is like, you know, a young deer or an older deer where sheep show their, their whole life story right on the side of their yeah. horn, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> Off to another mountain, I guess. Beauty. For me, a wildlife trophy can evoke a duality of emotions. On one hand, there's a sense of wistfulness and nostalgia, a poignant reminder of the ephemeral nature of all things. But it also awakens a sense of wonder and awe, an appreciation for the grandeur and diversity of the living world. I've been doing taxidermy for about 42 years. The origin was back in the late 1800s, but it was pretty crude. They'd take boards and some used straw and some used excelsior and wrap the forms and covered them with clay. And that was the beginning of taxidermy pretty much right there. But back when I started, there weren't too many foam forms. It was just the very beginning. Most of it was paper, laminated paper forms. And some of them were really good. And some of them were pretty crude. So you had to learn how to uh, finish molding them, I guess is what I'd call it. Use a lot of clay and to get it the right look. You had, to, you had to learn anatomy. I mean, it wasn't just a thing where you throw a skin on a form. Everything is foam forms now, and they're easy to work with, easy to alter, and there's lots, lots of sizes. 
So taxidermy has come quite a ways. You know, taxidermy is a is a science. It's an art form. It tells a, a story. It's 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 history, and um, it represents so much that's important to our country and to our our hunting heritage. Through generations of taxidermists, uh, they've been able to tell that story extremely well. So the idea of, of you know maintaining a mount for the wall um, is very much buried into our our culture. And it, it represents, again, uh, for everybody it's different, for the most part, it's, it's a memory. Uh, it's a tribute to that animal. It shows a level of respect that that, that animal is not discarded, was not forgotten. Uh, for me, I, I look at uh, you know an animal that I've got mounted on the wall and it takes me right back to you know that year, that day, that moment, that place. Uh, the, you know, the elation, the celebration, um, you know, and even the sadness. Um, so those, those are our trophies, and they are important. And it wasn't about the score, but it was about the hunt. A big part of a successful hunt is the memory of the hunt. You know, there's a lot of great memories. John Muir wrote, in every walk with nature, one receives far more than he seeks. Muir believed that nature has a way of providing a deep level of fulfillment and nourishment to the human spirit, far beyond what we consciously seek or expect to find. We had an awesome start to our morning today. We woke up and stuck the camera out the tent flap and there was a young ram at about 35 yards just watching us. I was able to film him. He was right on our spot and not. So I believe that that means it's going to be a really good day in sheep country. They've all been good days, but I think that's a little bit extra special start. For me, there is a kind of serenity that can only be achieved through immersion in wild places. Here, my senses come alive. Colors are more vibrant. The sounds of nature grow, filling the vacuum of day-to-day -day life left behind. The smell of earth and grass combine with the pure mountain air. I can feel my shoulders relax and my mind unwind letting go of worries and stresses. The relentless pace of modern life fades into insignificance, replaced by a profound sense of presence. This is incredible. I'm just soaking it up as best I can. It's incredible here. There is a wealth of scientific evidence that supports the incredible benefits of the natural world on our physical and mental health. Despite our unique cognitive abilities, the human race is still part of the animal kingdom. We are not outsiders looking in. We are integral components of the natural order, our well-being, and the well-being of our ecosystems are intertwined. Recently, the CDC has adopted a new initiative known as One Health. The concept of One Health recognizes the interconnection between the health of humans, animals, and the environment, highlighting the importance of an integrated approach for the well-being of all. This ram looks like it's coming our way. Yeah. Look at him. Hard to see, like, you know, age or any of that kind of stuff, but he looks like a good ram. One Health is, is not a new concept. Um, this goes all the way back to, uh, you know, Aldo Leupold, uh, you know, the father of game management and conservation, when he was preaching the fact that, you know, we have to look at not just a species, but an entire ecosystem 
And not only that, that humans are part of this ecosystem. Uh, we're not separate from it, we're part of it. So One Health is, is that same concept revisited that if we have clean air and if we have clean water and we're working toward those things and we have you know, healthy forests that wildlife is doing well, then we're doing well because we're part of that ecosystem. And this One Health a focus, I think, will help demonstrate that what we've known for years is true. And I'm also encouraged that, um, that those that may want to end hunting may start to learn that in many ways we're on the same side. That if we can work together for healthy habitat and healthy water and healthy air, um, we can all benefit and we can all thrive. Wildlife and humans together. Well, I think we finally found the old ram we're after. Oh, he looks old, but the body, best we can tell, he's 10, 11 years old. He just looks like a really good sheep. Which is really exciting. Exactly what we came for. So we're gonna drop out of sight of him here, try to gain some ground, and then start making those precious final few moves. As inhabitants of this planet, we bear a profound responsibility for the wildlife and ecosystems that surround us. Our actions, both positive and negative, have a direct impact on the delicate balance of nature and in turn, on the health of humanity itself. Left to their own devices, wildlife populations could spiral out of control and overpopulation becomes a threat, leading to competition for limited resources and the spread of disease among animals. So if selective hunting is not the answer, then what is? Well, we finally made it up to this ram, and he is absolutely everything I dreamed of finding when we set out on this hunt. The goal was to find a big old ram, the oldest one we could find, and as far as we can tell, this one is the oldest ram we've seen since we've been hiking the last eight or nine days one of the most physically demanding hunts I've ever been on. Took everything we had. It's so worth it sitting behind this old dude. Absolutely perfect ram to take out of the mountains. This is just what we were after. You can just see the age going through his horns here. All those rings, all those bumps and knobs all represent one year of this ram's life. Sheep wear their whole life story right there on the side of their horns. You can see good years, bad years. You can see when he's been fighting. It's incredible. Absolutely amazing animal. In 
the natural world, death, when it comes, rarely arrives gently or peacefully. The relentless forces of disease and illness can be prolonged and agonizing, while accidents and injuries often set the stage for brutal encounters with predators. Left to nature's course, there's little room for tranquil departures. Just seeing that ram's teeth too, his teeth just really solidified that that ram was not going to make it through the winter. There's no way. He might not have made it much after we saw him. Like he looked skinny. He had what they call lump jaw, big messed up teeth. I don't know how he could even eat. It just looked uncomfortable. You know, you look at where wild sheep live. Um, some of the most harshest climates, you know, in North America uh, and the world. Uh, it's amazing uh, when you think of how that sheep spending 10 to 12 to 14 winters and in, in the desert southwest summers surviving, eking out a, a living. What is sad is when they start to decline. And, you know, frankly, uh, I have no qualms with a hunter's bullet or arrow uh, ending the life of that 12 to 13 year old or 10 year old or nine year old sheep uh, versus a slow, terrible death of starvation. Is that why we hunt? No. Uh, is that a side benefit? You could say it is. Bottom line, you know, taking a wild sheep in a selective way, taking the old one, uh, that old monarch of the mountain, off the mountain, um, before he declines, is I think a noble and justifiable pursuit. Here you go. One, two, three. All right. <laughs> meat. Fresh meat. Take it to camp. <laughs> there is a unique joy in cooking a piece of backstrap on a hot rock after a long and challenging hunt. The primal connection to the land and the satisfaction of providing for oneself are felt deeply in these moments. In recent years, Meat hunting has grown in popularity due to a variety of factors. People are increasingly interested in sustainable and ethical food sourcing, seeking alternatives to factory farming. Whether you hunt primarily for meat or trophies, it's crucial to understand how your goals align with selective hunting practices. The dynamics of each particular herd are unique and must be considered. In cases of overpopulation, it may be more appropriate to harvest a female to keep her numbers in balance with available food. It's no longer about being a meat hunter or a hunter who goes after the oldest males with the biggest horns or antlers. Selective hunting prioritizes the well-being of wildlife above all else. And regardless of your motivation, if you're not practicing selective hunting, you may be causing harm rather than contributing to conservation efforts. I would say that's done to perfection. That's juicy. While selective hunting plays a vital role in wildlife management, there is another crucial aspect to consider. The financial support provided by hunters is essential for the continued existence and well-being of these magnificent animals in their natural habitat. The, the typical offtake is about one to three percent and the uh, agency biologists, wildlife professionals will, will tell us and do tell us that that's, that's a sustainable uh, harvest. But the critical thing, when you look at uh, hunting this, this iconic species and trophy species, as I would say, is um, the incredible amount of money 
that is raised for wild sheep conservation while taking such a small percentage of adult males off. Um, we call that the wild sheep economy. Uh, and literally millions of dollars annually are directed into the state, provincial, and tribal agencies for that minimal offtake. We already know, and it's well documented, that the majority of wildlife conservation, at least in this country and under the North American model, is funded by sportsmen. And, you know, it is an annually expensive uh, and time consuming endeavor to take care and manage wildlife. This notion that wildlife is just somehow miraculously going to take care of itself is a myth. You know, we're, our human population is growing at an exponential rate. We're consuming natural resources at an exponential rate. We're losing habitat. So conservation is, is going to continue to be even more important into the future than it is today. And there is not a replacement funding mechanism. You know, there's just not. What would be the consequences of hunting went away you're, you're talking about a collapse of the most successful wildlife conservation model mankind has ever devised. That's catastrophic. I'd hate to think of what it would be like without hunters and conservation organizations looking after animals like this and protecting places like this behind me. Without being here, without hunting, driving me to come to places like this, I don't know that I would care as much as I do about protecting them. You know, only coming here and experiencing it, being in these places, can you fully appreciate the beauty and just the majesty of everything around you. And it's hunters that, that have the, the mindset to come to these places and climb into these mountains and watch these animals. I think every person should create an opportunity to travel out here and feel alone and be a part of something as grand as this for a while. It'll change you. The feelings that I know The feelings that I know The feelings that I know Take my hand and say for show I can't keep on this road alone And all this time I thought I knew But all this time I wait's been you I can run but I can't hide the feelings that I know I can't keep up